Hello again, good morning, good afternoon from wherever you are. Uh, welcome to Partner Southeast Asia Arts and Culture Matters Day 2. My name is Camelia Harahap, or Kemi for short, and I am the Head of Arts for British Council in Indonesia, and I'll be your MC for this session. I am a woman with long black hair, brown spectacles, and currently wearing a light pink patchwork top. Over four days, we shall be taking you on a journey throughout Southeast Asia, exploring the arts and cultures of Indonesia, Malaysia, Myanmar, the Philippines, Thailand, and Vietnam. We intend to open your eyes to the array of opportunities that the region can offer, and that over the course of the next few days, you'll be able to be more knowledgeable on the region as a whole. We also hope that you can connect with your peers and counterparts through the various networking functions that the platform has to offer. We hope you enjoyed the sessions during our first day, and later on, I'll go through the rest of the week in more detail. However, in brief, we have five country briefing sessions and three thematic sessions, as well as a live networking session on the last day. So in total, we have over 70 amazing speakers for you lined up. For this country session on Indonesia, we have a few presentations on the insights into Indonesia's arts and culture landscape, and a panel discussion featuring UK and Indonesian artists. So we titled the session, Indonesia Beyond the Art of Nongkrong. What does Nongkrong actually mean? Well, Nongkrong can loosely be translated into hanging out, and that's exactly what we'd like to do today. Hanging out is often seen as a very integral part of networking and collaborations in Indonesia, and often great ideas and even greater collaborations can be developed through the simple act of hanging out. So without wasting any more time, I'd like to invite Hugh Moffat, the Country Director for Indonesia and Southeast Asia Cluster Lead at the British Council, who will kick off our Hangout session with the opening remarks. Over to you, Hugh. Thanks very much, Kemi, and welcome everyone. Welcome to our India Indonesia Hanging Out session. And I hope you enjoyed hanging out with us yesterday if you joined us for our Southeast Asia session uh, and our Creative Economy session, which would have, would have set the tone and give you some ideas of what we really want to talk about over these next few days. Mainly, it's about connections. And, and Indonesia and the UK have had many connections over the last uh, five years. Uh, from 2016 to 2019, we ran the UK Indonesia season. And since then, and of, of course, increasingly digitally, uh, we've then continued with lots of partnership programs, which has enabled over 250 organizations in the UK and Indonesia working together, individuals or organizations. And, and again, those incredible experiences we're going to hear a lot from our amazing panelists who will have shared, will be sharing the experiences that they have had uh, over the last period of time. And of course, uh, some, some of those who have designed the programs that have enabled these exchanges to be working. The context, of course, is, is the creative economy as well. And that Indonesia has a strong focus on this. It's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's currently leading the creative economy and, and sustainable development UN this year, the year of the creative economy. And into next year, as the G20 uh, leader continues to see creative economy and sustainable development as a core element of economic recovery post uh, post the, uh, the pandemic. And in the UK, uh, we've just had a recent visit from our Foreign Secretary, again, an endorsement that there will be a continued partnership between the UK and Indonesia with our Department of Culture, Media and Sport, working together with the Ministry of Tourism, Creative Economy for another five years. And the focus there very much on digital, not surprisingly, as a key element and interest that we have. And I hear, of course, that the president recently talked about unleashing the powers of 9 million digital talents across Indonesia. So how can we connect with that? So the purpose of this, this session really is to see how, what can we learn from our amazing panelists. Thank you to all of you for, for sharing. We're looking forward to the discussion. And also to inspire you, the audience, to hear and find out new ways of, of connecting with Indonesia. Uh, we want to hear your ideas. We want more partnerships. We want more connections between our two countries and within Southeast Asia. So back to you, Kemi, and let's, uh, let's get on with it. Thank you.
Good morning, good afternoon. I am Indonesian woman, black hair, wearing a turquoise blue top, and I'm so grateful to be here today. Thank you, the British Council, for organizing this amazing event. I'm honored to share with you the learning journey of Policy Sani as the only organization in Indonesia working on arts policy advocacy. We continue to learn by doing in collaborations with institutions, communities, a wide network of Kuali Sanis members throughout Indonesia. Just like the title of the session, Beyond the Art of Hanging Out, it all started when a group of people sat together and started a series of long discussions how each one managed to thrive artistically but realize we have not yet included the important stakeholders, the government and the business sector in our conversations. After numerous sessions of hanging out in 2012, a coalition for the arts was officially formed by 41 cross-disciplinary arts practitioners, including myself, to voice the arts sector in visible concerns. We realized most of us lack the knowledge to understand arts related policies and regulations. So Kuali grew organically. We learned by doing. We started talking with government officials and facilitated a series of public forums involving stakeholders. Serving as a knowledge hub, focusing on policy advocacy in the arts, Kuali envisions an art endowment fund in Indonesia while strengthening the management of knowledge and networks. We wouldn't be here without the support from all of our collaborators, including many of you here today. Thank you. To mention a few of Kualisi Sani collaborations, Kualisi Sani facilitated the first ever Indonesia music conference back in 2018. That same year, and the following, a milestone, for we managed to highlight the role of the arts in the prestigious Indonesia Development Forum, an annual forum held by the Ministry of National Development Planning. Last year, the Ministry of Education and Culture involved Kuali Sisani in the preparation of UNESCO 2005 Convention QPR. UNESCO then commissioned Kuali Sisani to survey artistic freedom in Indonesia. The results show there were many violations of the six human rights underlying artistic freedom and the apparent need for collaboration with human rights organizations to advocate the issue. After launch of the study, Kuali Sisani was invited by the National Human Rights Commissions to provide input for the artistic expression section in the standard norms and regulations on freedom of opinion and expression. The scarcity of data, many of the speakers yesterday voice of social impacts created by arts and cultural activities, the lack of data about communities contributing to the development of their surroundings, among others, through local initiative, arts and cultural festivals, hinders us from efficiently campaigning for our goals. To encourage donations in 2010, the government issued tax incentives for donation, including for arts and culture activities, research and development, educational facilities, and in-kind donation to social infrastructures. However, regulation for philanthropic tax deduction is still deemed unclear by many. Understandably, this causes reluctance of potential contributors who are unsure about who they can donate to to get tax deductions. Due to the lack of support mechanisms for the arts, only a few Indonesian arts and culture organizations relied on dwindling international funds, like many in the Southeast Asia regions. Sporadic support to the arts and culture sector offered in the form of sponsorships, mostly given to support special events with big audiences only. I'd like to echo the keynote speaker yesterday mentioned about UNESCO study in the Southeast Asia region. Many artists, juggles jobs to subsidize the research and development of their innovative arts creation process. They become philanthropists 
themselves. A concerted effort of Quality Sunny's analysis and recommendation pushed the redrafting of the initially problematic culture bill, yielding the law on the advancement of culture. The law acknowledges and embraces Indonesia's cultural diversity, positions community as the owner and driving force of the culture, and positions the arts and culture as the means and objectives of development. It stipulates funding for the advancement of culture is based on investment consideration, as opposed to the old paradigm of viewing arts and cultural activities as cost. Polysystemist monitoring analysis and policy recommendations resulted in further discussions and the official signing of regulations that were previously stagnant. To engage the public, the research and policy reviews are communicated through various medias, including our website, podcast, Instagram Live, and op-ed articles. Qualisisini was actively involved in the formulation of the law on the advancement of culture. It mandates the establishment of the Cultural Endowment Fund and the government as facilitator, not patron. However, challenges remain. Local versus central government are not yet aligned. Different understanding in different localities slows down implementation. As for the law on creative economy, Polisisini was consulted towards the end of the formulation. It mandates development of sustainable creative ecosystem, sees the creative sector as potential source of GDP. However, the challenges are in the law of creative economy, no specific institution to carry the mandates, no clear definition of creative practitioners as workers and doesn't specify their rights. Regulations on implementation remain unclear and limit artistic expressions. Now, currently, Indonesian Art Policy Advocacy class, we help in partnership with the Gentera Indonesian Law School to equip arts practitioners with the knowledge and practical theories, strategies, and advocacy tools. Workshop on artistic freedom held in collaboration with UNESCO as a continuation of research on artistic freedom. Participants included artists and human rights activists. Policy Sunni's gender working group succeeded in encouraging Ministry of Education and Culture to give special priority to women in their funding program. The gender working group also facilitated capacity building programs, including proposal development workshop. Now, our current challenges. Most violation cases of artistic freedom are not yet reported by the mass media, especially if they do not involve well-known artists or important figure. There's no government institution that monitors the condition of artistic freedom. Even the 2016 and 2020 edition of the UNESCO Convention 2005 QPR Indonesia did not fulfill its obligation to include a report on the condition of artistic freedom. Many regulations still restrict artistic expression. This is among others due to increasing conservatism and political polarization. Another, work in the arts is not yet considered an occupation to be protected by Indonesia's labor law. Most of the jobs in the art sector do not yet have the Indonesian national work competency standards, making it difficult to standardize and be certified. This results in the absence of standard minimum wages, standard prices for the procurement of art services, standard working hours, occupational health and safety, not to mention health coverage, are not yet applied to the art sector. Ambiguous copyright law focuses on protecting music copyright only. Royalty provisions for other art disciplines are only regulated in general manners and depend on market mechanisms. The system for collecting and distributing music royalties in Indonesia is not transparent nor accountable. Collecting society operates like a cartel, causing inconsistent music royalty rates. 
we still need a lot of data to push for more philanthropic tax deductions for contributions to ERs to include the business sector and the government in our conversations. On gender, Qualisisani has started research determining the ratio of female art council chairperson, leaders and managers in arts organizations, and the ratio of female artists in art awards. It shows gender inequality. There remains a lot to do. More research and data collection will need to be done in the coming years. We can't do it alone. We are interested in building strategic partnerships with like-minded organizations. We would appreciate expert advice, support, and opportunity to collaborate. As many of us are struggling with scarcity of data, we would like to learn how other countries deal with those issues to increase understanding of how the arts can bring positive change in the well-being of all. Thank you very much for listening. We look forward to the opportunity to connect and to collaborate for a healthier ecosystem. Thank you so much, Linda, for helping us to set the scene by providing some really useful insights into the arts and cultural landscape in Indonesia and what exactly policy has been doing to support the sector. So the next segment is a presentation of research of recent research that the British Council had commissioned. The first research is on cultural cities profiles and it was commissioned by Tom Fleming Creative Consultancy and was conducted in four countries in East Asia, Indonesia, Malaysia, Vietnam, and China. In Indonesia, we had research into 14 cities with the support of the Indonesia Creative Cities Network, CIPG, and Tanah Indi. The second research is mapping the landscape of festivals in Southeast Asia which was commissioned to Jogja Festival Study Center and Tom Fleming Creative Consultancy. So without further ado, I'd like to invite Tom Fleming to introduce the segment and the presentation of the two research supported by Tita Larasati and Valencia Hutabarat. Everybody. My name's Tom Fleming, and I'm a middle-aged man with a black top and large headphones on. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be with you today. And where to begin, really? Uh, we've already heard about the, uh, the need for data and evidence in an enormous country of over 260 million people, 34 provinces, 17,000 islands, and an incredibly diverse and fast-changing 
arts and cultural sector and wider creative economy. We've heard already about the emergent policy landscape and there's a real energy and appetite to develop and to grow and to formalize the creative industries across Indonesia and to do so through collaboration, both internally in terms of building networks and exchange and externally in terms of building international relations. Uh, and data and evidence are critical here. My company has been really privileged to be working closely with the British Council over the last 18 months or so on two major pieces of research um, which you just heard being introduced. One focused on developing profiles of the cultural and creative sectors, the cultural and creative life really of 14 cities across Indonesia, um, right across the archipelago. Um, and this was to understand and to be able to describe the, the way the cities are changing, the way that they're engaging with their diverse and distinctive cultural assets, and also to identify where there are opportunities for collaboration with the UK, but also um, with other countries internationally. And this is because there's, there's an appetite for exchange and there's a need for exchange to help to build capacity, to validate the sector and to develop and to grow and to innovate. And then a second piece of research was also undertaken, which focused on the role that festivals have in uh, driving transformation and developing capacity in the cultural and creative industries across Indonesia, but also across the Southeast Asian region, and critically being inclusive, safe spaces for a diversity of cultural expressions, for enabling and providing platforms for, for development for people who perhaps historically have not been part of the cultural conversation. Uh, so these two pieces of research, we're going to profile them today. I've got two absolute powerhouses and pioneers of the uh, Indonesian cultural and creative economy here to talk to you. Um, first of all, we've got Tita Larasati, who is an activist, a visionary, a, 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 a leading thinker, and also working directly with the UK with the uh, Creative Industries Policy and, and Evidence Centre to exchange knowledge about the Indonesian and global creative industries back into the UK so that we learn together. And then we have Valencia Hutbarat, who is an, also a pioneer, a cultural producer, an activist, a researcher working across the cultural landscape of Indonesia and globally. And, and then she's going to talk about the work that uh, we've been developing on festivals in Indonesia and beyond. Um, so I'm going to hand over now to Tita. And Tita, if you could describe the work that you've been undertaken focusing on cities, and also we'll learn so much, I'm sure, about the, the, the transforma transforming cultural and creative economy of Indonesia. Tita. Um, Tita Larasati. So as mentioned, um, I've been working with Tom for the cultural cities um, research, but to give you an overview about Nongkrong as well, because uh, what makes people or young people do the Nongkrong culture or the hanging out? So this is hanging out with an attitude. So you don't just meet your friends, but then you do more. And to give you the basics is these numbers. Uh, if you see, Tom has also mentioned that we have so many provinces and all, but then the young people really dominates the demography. They are 70% more of young people of productive age, and they have a, a, a technology, media, and so on. So they have this input about, uh, they have this access, and they have all this uh, inspiration and all. So we have all these challenges and opportunities. So in a city, if you see, there are lots of initiatives of young people to gather, and then not only gathering, they also make businesses there usually, and they also have uh, activities, festivals, and so on and so on, because it uh, goes uh, with their preference. And most, uh, they also use um, places that are mostly idle, and then they turn it into something uh, vibrant. And of course, it has to do with the economic um, uh, motivation, but also they have other um, purposes, uh, bigger purposes that actually change the city or really uh, give a contribution to how they would like to see their city uh, better to accommodate themselves and so on. So um, within ICCN, within the Indonesia Creative Cities Network, we already map uh, these many uh, creative hubs, uh, belongs to the young people, and then it keeps growing still. So by doing uh, this kind of research and mapping and also identifying what they need, uh, we usually go back to, the, uh, to our own characteristics. So if you see a place as, a, as an organic entity that also uh, like a human body, if you put intervention in a, a spot, 
with creativity, then you usually want to heal it or you want to make it better. So uh, then because at SCCN, this is within the context of SCCN because we have so many people uh, from different cities and regencies. There are now 210 uh, about members. Uh, we are putting this kind of framework. So we have a kind of guideline. If we see ourselves as a creative city or creative agency, then what does it mean? Uh, where do you want to go? Or how do you, what do you use as a, as a guideline to move on? So we have this, our 10 principles of uh, in creative cities that comply with the sustainable development goals. Uh, and if we talk about uh, creative economy, we always talk about the ecosystem. So not only the creative industries. And if we talk about the stakeholders, there's all this uh, hexahelix now, so academia, business sectors, and so on, uh, that actually needs to uh, have the synergy to make uh, to get things going. Um, I'm moving to the next slide. Oh, this is okay. So um, wait, maybe I skip some. Yes. Um, yeah, so with this framework, then uh, during the pandemic, or it's actually at the beginning of the pandemic, when the government still needs time to gather data to be able to uh, distribute their aids uh, properly or to the people who need it really. So we use our own uh, bottom up and grassroots uh, information from these communities all over Indonesia to make this kind of um, uh, program mitigate and survive, recover, reestablish, and develop and grow and sustain, but then within uh, this creative economic context. Um, and this, you can see uh, that uh, we also contribute to the white paper and policy recommendations of uh, U20 in Riyadh, G20 uh, 2020, uh, titled Inclusive Creative Economy and the Future of Work. So here, our argument is that if you want to face the future uh, or you want to answer the challenges of SDG, uh, you should do this uh, human-centered development. Uh, and then this blue person who runs uh, towards the SDG, they can use the means of technology and so on to uh, properly. And I think um, um, initiatives from bottom-up is not enough. So you have to really reinforce uh, your uh, concept and your methods and models through different channels. So here we have, for example, at ITB, where I also teach, we have this um, conference called Fostering Creative Economy for Sustainable Development to gather ideas from academics about uh, their ideas about creative economy for the future. And then we are also holding connecticity uh, by having this team, uh, mostly about creative hubs in regional uh, level and how they would uh, influence the development of the uh, province or cities or regencies. And our also, our effort came to uh, the passing of a bill on creative economy at city level. So this is uh, to in order to guarantee that whoever takes the lead of the city will always uh, do the uh, creative economy as one of their uh, purposes. And um, talking about collaboration, actually, uh, we have been uh, working a lot with also with the with this council and partners. For example, we have uh, done this. Um, Fusion Cities uh, presentation about how we have the idea for future destination tourism and so on. In the middle, you can see the yellow um, documents. These are a part of our research on informal economy, especially for the global south. And on the, on the right hand side, um, this is the, what uh, Tom was mentioning about cultural cities research with our partners, CIPG and uh, Tanah Indi. And also, uh, the, of course, 14 cities have 14 different characteristics. So this is maybe not a real uh, solid um, or it's, it's still, it's still, it, can be, it can be developed. But then if you can see uh, there are four quadrants here, if you want to map cities and you want to see uh, from this mapping uh, what kind of collaboration you would like to do with them, what, what kind of characteristic that they would prefer. So uh, these cities are uh, roughly uh, distributed into the four quadrants. Uh, actually, there are three quadrants that are filled. One is empty. So uh, one top to another is uh, some cities can be more advanced or complete in the infrastructure uh, facilities and so on. The others can be really uh, limited in the infrastructure. Other cities are heavily loaded with traditional cultural contents. The other are really uh, having strong industrial manufacturer contents. So within this mapping, we have a rough... Um, uh, we can have a rough picture about uh, what the cities can be and what kind of, um, of collaboration you can have. 
and in the in the next um uh, i think this is uh, almost my last slide um we have uh, okay so yeah we have these highlights and momentums where we can actually uh, mainstream we, we want to mainstream creative economy within the global context of economy uh in in this sense is the uh, world conference on creative economy for example and g20 uh, of the talks where they would do the direction of where our economy will be and we have been arg arguing about this uh, creative economy as being the solution if you want to uh, answer the challenges of SDG. So we are again strengthening uh, that conclusion through, um, you, you saw the policy recommendations, and then we have this UNTAP 15 and Barbados uh, with these results. And then the latest is the ADBI, uh, ASEAN Development Bank uh, uh, Institute in Tokyo. We have this policy paper symposium and we are gathering this, uh, delivering a robust, inclusive and sustainable recovery that we will take to the next year uh, within the G20 uh, presidency in Indonesia, uh, where we would like to, again, uh, discuss the uh, economy, uh, creative economy as a solution. So I think that's from me. Thank you, Tom. Thank now we are moving to uh, Ellen. Thank you, so, thank you so much, Tita. And, and a lot of you would have clocked that Tita is in an airport lounge at the moment, hence the, the, the noise in the background. So thanks, Tita, for persevering with all of that distraction behind you. Um, and I think that it's fair to say that what we witnessed in the research on cities is that there's a, there's a kind of new generation of creative city making underway in, 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 across Indonesia, almost redefining approaches to creativity and urbanism. And you can uh, check out the research, I think, in the Indonesian pavilion uh, on Hopin, and you can dig in and see what's happening across those 14 cities. And in each of the cities, festivals are playing a critical role in a convening and catalyzing force for the city in terms of their cultural life. And Valencia Hutbarat is now going to just give a quick overview of the festival's research that's been undertaken. Valencia, over to you. Thank you, Tom. Uh, good afternoon, good morning, everyone. Yes, uh, we have been, uh, my name is Valencia Hutbarat. I'm Indonesian woman uh, and, uh, residing in Jakarta. Uh, we've done this research this year on the landscape of the festivals in Southeast Asia to see the link between the uh, arts and culture festivals and the creative economy. Um, so what we found, uh, we have 168 respondents all over uh, Southeast Asia from six countries, but we have 87 respondents in Indonesia. As you can see, the, um, there is like, a, uh, it's quite difficult to run the survey in time because of the, you know, the different, the different landscape. Also, when it comes to the arts and culture uh, uh, participants, um, it's not very, you know, it's not in there. <laughs> they rather do things than fill it in a survey. So that's a, a challenge in itself. Um, so the, the findings that we have is uh, with the festival creation, uh, a lot of them is uh, coming from celebrations of traditions and cultural identity. And uh, they're showcasing innovation in the art sectors and they're opening opportunities in alternative market networks and establishing arts ecosystem and network. Um, in relation to the nongkrong, to the, the hangout uh, uh, activity, um, as you can see, a lot of these festivals, if it's not uh, if it's not government initiated, then it actually comes from you know a few people coming together, having an idea, and decided to uh, to make it uh, come through. So if you can see in the festival production, uh, the second one, it was based on collegial approach. So there's a lot of uh, festivals that are coming from just hanging out together, especially in Indonesia. And that uh, in particular uh, results in many different festivals. So we have uh, in Yogyakarta alone, uh, where Yogyakarta Festival is from, uh, we have more than 400 festivals uh, in the city alone. So you can imagine the number of the festivals throughout Indonesia and uh, throughout uh, Southeast Asia. Um, in the production itself, 80% are citizens' initiative and self-organized. Uh, this is very important, again, because it comes from hanging out with a, a fellow creative or a friends. Uh, so then uh, a lot of them are actually uh, producing these festivals themselves. And then when it comes, as it becomes bigger, and then uh, you get more support from uh, sponsors or uh, government, or even you can also have uh, tickets and merchandise. Um, the, uh, a lot of these festivals are admission free. This is due to the fact that a lot of the initiators of the festivals wanted to have a very accessible festival, very accessible content for the audience. 
So, um, and the incredible thing to see is actually the resilience of all these festivals because like most of our participants have at least uh, uh, run the festival for more than six to uh, more than six years and more than 10 years. Like that's the majority of our uh, participants. So it's incredible to see like through uh, out Southeast Asia, how resilient these festivals are, even though there are uh, very uh, small so far uh, contribution from the, the government. Um, in terms of the uh, festival programming, uh, that we found that there are like the six uh, functions of the festivals is knowledge production, cultural exchange, showcasing and collaborative work, reflection, education, and public appreciation. Um, just a bit on the, uh, the, if you can see this is the main focus, just to share a bit about the Jogja festivals. Uh, we are actually uh, an organization that uh, is established that was founded by 15 festivals, a uh, national and international festival from uh, in Jogja. Uh, and uh, from there, we are now uh, opening a Jogja festival forum that has a member of 55 festivals uh, all around uh, Indonesia. And we also, uh, because of uh, uh, the Jogja festival, we are able to also uh, help the establishment of the Event Workers uh, Association in, in Jogja. Um, just uh, the, the last one, uh, there are like these functions of the festivals that we found um, that has been done, which is uh, knowledge nurturing, showcasing, uh, market provision, art progress, network, cultural nurturing, and, uh, and other, uh, other functions. And through that, there is already an achievement. We have again recognition, growth, audience, and participation. And the impact of these festivals uh, after you know 10 years uh, it has gained visits it has gained financial sustainability so there's uh, there is a lot of employment uh, created uh, transactions so there are not only the festivals but also other events that are happening around the festivals uh, we created market and we created a uh, social change which is the most uh, important thing um, i think we can just um, stop there Tom, and maybe we can discuss more uh, during Thank the uh, discussion Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And it's, it's really interesting to hear how festivals have become more impact facing. They're, they're really key in terms of activism, really important in terms of providing places and platforms for people to express themselves. And it links to the economy, yes, but actually it's also about social development, which is really clear in the research. Um, I just have um, the same question for both of you in the time we have left, which is, you know, it's fascinating to hear about festivals in the cities. But where do you think that there are opportunities or the main opportunities for international exchange and collaboration? Obviously, thinking about the UK, where can exchange with the UK arts and cultural sector be most impactful for Indonesian festivals? And also in terms of approaches to city making. So perhaps, Valencia, if you could just reflect on that first and then Tito over to you in terms of cities. Okay, thank you. In terms of the collaborations uh, from the Georgia festivals, we realize that there is a lot of need again about data. Yeah, we are very weak at data collecting, and we know that there are several studies that have been done in the UK uh, regarding about how uh, festivals can have impact on the city uh, and the creative economy within the city. So I think that's one of the important things that we can learn uh, from the UK. But at the same time, uh, maybe what we can offer to the UK is also like the uh, how uh, festivals can grow organically here, regardless of how little government support that we have, because if we see like your, your national support, National Arts Council, for example, give a lot of support to the Festival of Arts Organization, we uh, barely, we have, we start having that now, but maybe there are things that can be learned from the resilience of uh, the organizations and the festival organizations uh, that we have here in Indonesia. Thank you. And, and, and I remember that Jogja Festivals, which has been such a catalyst in terms of festival development in, in Indonesia, um, was supported through an exchange led by the British Council with Edinburgh festivals uh, a few years ago. So that's a, a direct outcome of that kind of collaboration. Yeah. Um, Tita, uh, what would you say is a kind of priority for exchange and, and I guess mutual learning for city making? I think this is really possible because for example, as in Bandung now, Bandung is the UNESCO city of design. And we are currently having our Bandung Design Biennale and uh, there are about 30 events per weekend. So, and those are really um, a mix of many things that, that also collaborates with other countries as well. So it's very important. Thank you. And um, just a, another question, which is, is around the connection between what you might call sort of community activism 
and mm. very informal activity and policy. And this applies to festivals and to cities and you know, how you perhaps um, making the connections between the, you know, the top down and, and, the, and the bottom up. <laughs> Yes, it's important to have this kind of communication because we know from the bottom up, we just do things that we do. But then if you want to take things from the top down, you really need to have this evidence so the government can have the justification of their policy and regulations and of course budget because it comes to that. So we are now developing from the bottom up, uh, we call it Creative City Index, that we can uh, actually connect it to, the, uh, to our government's KPI. So that's where creativity and other things that they might think uh, maybe sub, 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 uh, uh, things that they should take care of, it can be lifted up higher to the things that they should really take care of because uh, otherwise uh, they don't have any tools to, again, justify what they do with the regulations. So that's what that's what we're doing, Tom. Excellent. Thank you, Tita. I'm, I'm very conscious of time and uh, I know that there's been quest there are questions coming in through Hopin, but we have to hop off, I feel, um, onto the next session. Um, I think that, uh, the, that we can perhaps... Um, convened some discussions offline um, on the basis of those questions. So hopefully you'll be able to reconnect with Tita and, and Valencia uh, in the future. I want to thank you both for your, your brilliant in, um, introductions to the, I know what is such complex and far reaching research. Um, and I'll hand back now to our colleagues at the British Council. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much to all the speakers from the first part of the session, Linda, Tom, Tita and Valencia for setting the scene and sharing some really useful insights into the sector in Indonesia. The, if the audiences are interested, we have some of the existing reports that was mentioned during the conversation. It's uh, available in our country pavilions and my colleagues will be able to share some of the links in the chat. However, you're also able to join the post discussion huddle afterwards and perhaps meet with some of our speakers to discuss more about the insights that they shared earlier today. All right, so next we all we will have a panel discussion moderated by Adam Pushkin. Adam is an experienced producer of international creative collaborations, residencies, and festivals in the UK, India, and Indonesia, and currently being based between UK and USA. Previously, Adam led the British Council Arts programs in India and until 2019 in Indonesia, including the design and oversight of the UKID program that created international connections for over 250 artists, organizations, and collectives in the UK and in Indonesia. He played a leading role in successful projects such as Festival Bebas Batas, Indonesia's first disability arts festival, and the Indonesia Market Focus at London Book Fair. Adam also worked in the UK with organizations such as Cheltenham Literature Festival, Queer Up North, and The Place. Since 2020, Adam has been freelance, including conducting research on the UK cultural sector's plan for engagement with South Asia, and forging a new producing team and developing international collaborations for Shout, Birmingham's Festival of Queer Arts and Culture. So Adam will be in conversation with three panelists from Indonesia and the UK. I'll hand over to Adam to provide more info on the discussion topic and the panelists. However, before we go to Adam, and in order to highlight the magic of collaboration between UK and Indonesia, we'd just like to show you a video compilation of some of our most recent UK and Indonesia collaborative projects that have been delivered virtually throughout the pandemic.
Good morning and uh, good afternoon if you're in Southeast Asia or Salamat Zore to everybody in Indonesia. My name is Adam Pushkin. I'm a freelance creative producer and consultant. Uh, and as Kemi said, I spent three and a half happy years based in Indonesia. Uh, and essentially, this session is about what we can gain from working collaboratively between the UK and Indonesia and how we can go about it to make it as successful as possible. And we're going to be learning from three uh, artists and artistic directors, all of whom have experience of developing and sustaining creative relationships between the UK and Indonesia. Uh, so before we start, I want to hear from everybody briefly. So let's all just say a, a quick hello and introduce yourselves. Uh, let's start with uh, Sarah from, from Coraline. Hi, Sarah. Hi, thanks, Adam. Yes, uh, hello, everybody. I'm Sarah. I'm the artistic director of Coraline. Uh, I'm a middle-aged woman with my hair tied back and wearing a pink jumper sitting in front of a pink background. Uh, uh, Coraline is a dance company based in Brixton in London. We've got a youth company and an adult company, and our dancers all have a learning disability. We also make integrated practice as well with dancers who don't identify as disabled. And we worked with Gigi Art of Dance based in Jakarta uh, for two projects since 2019. That's fantastic. And we'll, we'll come back to you in a moment to hear more about those projects. Uh, we also have uh, the fantastic artist Hannah Madness uh, joining us from Indonesia. Hi, Hannah. Hi, Adam. Hello, everyone. My name is Hannah Alviki, or well known as Hannah Madness, a 20 year old Asian female with shoulder length black hair, a piercing under my lips, and tattoos on both my arms. And I'm wearing a gray tank top. I'm a visual artist based in Jakarta, Indonesia. Commonly, I use my art and my voice as medium to address mental health issues based on my personal experience as a person living with mental disabilities. And it started in 2012. And now I've been working in both disability and non-disability contexts involving individuals, groups, from uh, both from the government and private sectors. Thank you, Hannah. Fantastic. And uh, the final member of our panel is Jack Lowe. Good morning, Jack. Morning, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jack Lowe. I'm the Artistic Director, Chief Executive and Technical Dramaturg of Curious Directive, a theatre company based in Norwich. I am a mid-30s white man wearing um, tortoiseshell glasses, uh, a striped t-shirt and a very old blue hoodie, and I have a white background. Um, Curious Directive makes uh, theatre, devised and collaborative theatre, um, always around themes of science. Um, and yeah, we've had uh, many different interactions with um, Indonesian artists over the last four years. Thank you all. And uh, apologies, I should have also uh, de described my appearance. I'm a, a middle-aged white man uh, with a, a white shirt covered in um, Indonesian instant noodle illustrations um, in front of a background of... Uh, of, of books and the door of my room. Um, so before we move on, uh, the session has been entitled Beyond the Value of Nongkrong. Um, Hannah, as the, as the Indonesian on our panel, I wondered if you, is Nongkrong important to your work? Of course. So should I explain uh, about Nongkrong in general first? Very, very briefly, if you could, from your perspective. Okay. So Nongkrong is the lingua franca of young people, which in Indonesia is almost the same thing uh, as squatting, sitting, or leaning on a place. And if uh, translated into English, Nongkrong means hanging out. The lifestyle of Nongkrong in Indonesia has existed since long, long time ago until now and have undergone several changes over the times. In the past, for example, Nongkrong was usually only done in small coffee shops, the activities carried out are also simpler, just to hang out with friends. But nowadays, mm. nongkrong activities are mostly done in cafes or even in restaurants. Still, like the old days, the core activity on, or, uh, of nongkrong is to socialize. So basically, nongkrong is an activity carried out by young people and adults in a place together and do activities to fill their spare time. In Indonesia, especially especially in Java, where my parents originally come from, we are familiar with the term mangan ora mangan waton kumpul. That is Japanese language, which means whatever the condition is to it or not, the important thing is to gather. 
the sentence shows that the habit of tongkrong or hangout has been mm. rooted in Indonesian people's life because gathering and chatting has become a culture for Indonesian people. And in Jakarta, so, where I live, we can find hangout spots everywhere from coffee shops, small shops, <coughs> even to luxury restaurants. Many have no switch uh, function, not only as a places to eat, but also as gathering places coupled with free Wi-Fi access. Nongkrong can be also be means of sharing information and ideas. Even though the, 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 the culture of nongkrong seems lazy and useless for many people, especially parents, I think it can be tremendous potential if the content of the conversation being discussed uh, pr- produce ideas that can have a positive impact on ourselves and our environment. Because when we are nongkrong, we usually talk about various things, starting from personal problems, culture, politics, economy, nationality, to the environment. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. I could say that I am someone who has grown up in the hangout scene, atau uh, anak nongkrong, since I was <laughs> in junior high school, which yeah. brought me into the art scene, both visual and uh, musical, especially underground. And, light, and lately, I'm often involved with several projects from the agency to, the in, to interviews with the media where my friends work there. So we used to be just friends a long time ago in the same scenes, but it ended up being a professional collaboration. So for me, it definitely creates a lot of opportunities, whether I realize it, realize it or not. And for me, yeah. the nongkrong is arena. Uh, it's the <clears throat> most uh, honest arena, social arena, mm-hmm. institution on earth, on earth as a place for young people to exchange ideas, discuss, and love at their condition and the state of the country. Yeah. Indonesia also uh, has a culture of hosting guests, whether if you, came, if you come from outside of the region, or from abroad, usually they will be happy, happy to invite us to hang out and serve us with local food or drinks, <laughs> such as fermented traditional drinks that contains alcohol. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> we, now we now we we it's a bit early in the morning in the UK for uh, for, for thinking about that. Um, but <laughs> but no, thank you, Hannah. That's a fantastic um, fantastic introduction of provocation. And um, last year, as some of you may know, I, r- I wrote an article for Arts Professional Magazine, a UK uh, journal ostensibly about Indonesia's preponderance of arts collectives and what we might be able to learn from them here in the UK. Um, and I spoke to several people in, involved in Indonesian arts collectives, and in every single case, they mentioned the value of nongkrong as part of the creative process. Um, and of course, creating uh, the space for that sort of really unplanned time does have implications for organisations and how we how we run them, and it has implications for content around the notions of authorship, uh, for example. And one UK artist described it as a challenge to the industrialization of time that we've become used to in the UK. And speaking of which, we need to crack on. So I should say, if you have any questions for uh, any of the panel or for all of us together, please do ask through the through the Hopin platform, and we'll try to take a couple of questions from the floor uh, if we have time to do that. Um, so firstly, I wanna come to each of you and just ask you about your story of collaboration between the UK and Indonesia. Um, and let's let's start with Sarah. Uh, tell us about, you mentioned that you've been collaborating with Gigi Art of Dance. Um, how does that start and, and how has it evolved? Uh, well, uh, th- thank you for uh, to Hannah for explaining about Nongkrom and, and how important it is to Indonesian culture. That was really fascinating to hear. I haven't had that background before. Uh, So just to explain how Coralie came to come together with Gigi, it wasn't in that kind of context, but it wasn't usual roots. Coralie was collaborating with the dance company who are based in Bristol called Impermanence. And Impermanence sent me a text message. I was sitting in my friend's van we'd just seen a performance and she was dropping me off in a car park it was about 9 p.m so it was dark and I got a text message from Josh who works for Impermanence saying would DJ like to come to Indonesia and I started laughing and Bridget who is with me who's a Coralie Associate Artistic Director said what are you laughing about and I said 
DJ has just been invited to Indonesia. So DJ is also one of Coralize Associate Artistic Directors. He does identify as having a learning disability. And I text Josh back and said, well, yes, of course. Chatted to DJ. He was very nervous about it, but really keen to go. So DJ went to Indonesia in 2019 to lead a residency. And British Council worked together with Coralie and Impermanence to identify a group of dancers that could take part in the residency at the end of a theatre platform. So um, Jakarta Theatre Platform Festival. So that sort of resonates with some of the earlier speakers this morning about the importance of festivals. But anyway, we identified a group that could work with DJ, which happened to be Gigi Art of Dance. And a beautiful synergy began about how to share practice led by DJ who has a learning disability. And it was really important for us to showcase our work through DJ's methodologies. And a lot of learning happened there from participants seeing that they too could be the owners of their own work. And from that gem, we've continued to work together. Apologies, I was on mute. Uh, that's fantastic to hear. and. I understand that you've developed the relationship quite substantially during lockdown after the initial introduction. How was that? How was that process of getting to know, uh, getting to know your collaborators better while working remotely? It actually created a framework of communication that was quite helpful. Um, in fact, the, the meetings were anything but non crom I, I had to be really <laughs> on it, I have to admit, to try to catch up with how fast Gigi's yeah. ideas were and also how on top of the technology they were. So I'd go in and say, oh, well, we could do a digital toolkit and share ideas. And then hundreds and hundreds of ideas came from Gigi about how we could utilise technology to share the ideas. Uh, but uh, it, it, it created a framework that, which meant we knew when we were going to be speaking to each other and sort of develop the project in that way, meaning communication was supported by it being locked down in terms of needing to set key times to come together. But yeah. it, uh, it also meant that we were working on ideas uh, in our own time and then coming back together at key moments to see how things had developed. And the, the concept was a digital dance toolkit. So Coralie made some videos that showcased mm. our dancers' ways of working and shared those with Gigi dancers who then created their own responses to the prompts and developed film work from that. And was that digital dance toolkit uh, something that already existed uh, that you had, had created in the UK or is that something that you made especially for the collaboration we with Indonesia? We made it especially for the collaboration with Indonesia. So it was a much bigger learning, to, uh, much bigger learning process than we had anticipated because we needed to deconstruct our own methodologies far mm. more than we had first expected to in order to share something that was accessible, which was uh, underlined the project, not only language barriers, but also we're working with people with learning disabilities. So it had to be a really, really accessible toolkit, but also really representative of the dancers' ways of working. Fantastic. And just quickly, if we want to check out the digital dance toolkit, can we can we get that now? You well, at the moment it, you can. I'll make sure that it's available. We'll yeah. put the link. Yeah, we'll yeah. put the links in the hop in. Yeah. Um let's let's come to Jack next. Uh, uh because uh, we we, we'd love to hear about your story. Now, you've worked with quite a number of different uh, people in Indonesia over in a number of different ways. Just tell us a little bit about that, that story, Jack. Yeah, I've, I've um, been to Indonesia four times um, uh, and some, sometimes very much outside of a British Council structure working artistically and sometimes inside a British Council um, programme. Uh, I first went to Indonesia uh, to film underwater in Sarong, all the way in West Papua. And then uh, another time I came to Indonesia was to bring that play to Jakarta ID, a play called Frogman. Um, and I guess probably I would say one of the most profound interactions has been uh, with uh, the Bombo Collective, uh, with uh, Rice uh, um, and Reza. Um, and they, they are... 
I guess, trans transdisciplinary artists. Um, and uh, that was an, that was a collaboration that began in 2018 and it kind of it continues to today, really, um, a collaboration uh, on a project about cave paintings, a cave called Liang Timpaseng, which translates as the cave of internal spring which was my most profound uh, non korong session outside a cave with <laughs> keeper of a cave and cigarettes and, and, uh, and coffee. Um, yeah. And that collaboration uh, sort of accelerated, I guess, during lockdown. And I, last night I was looking over the zoom recordings and, and it's totally true about the infrastructure in place now to continue those existing mm -hmm. relationships um, and yeah, and Rais did the video and Reza did the sound design for um, our last our last production here in the UK. And so, Jack, you've had a number of different um, uh, you've had a number of different interactions with with various different people and organizations in Indonesia. And you've ended up building a really good long standing relationship with with Bombo, who are based in Makassar. Uh, what was it that? That, what was it about about uh, about Bombo that that made you think, yeah, these these are people that we really want to continue working with? Um, I mean, they're both um, effortlessly cool. Um, <laughs> they um, their ideas are expansive. Um, I love um, how so in the UK, devised and collaborative theatre um, is actually fairly conservative in terms of its its thinking sometimes. But I love how. As artists, they can turn their hand to video, they can turn their hand to sound, they, mm. they have an interest beyond their individual discipline, and that works mm. really well for me. Um, they autodidact, so they'll 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 teach themselves things, and and there's also a wider family of artists that they work with, which I find really inspiring, and, and that does connect with how how I work here in the UK, even though in Makassar there isn't really a theater infrastructure at all. Um, yeah. but that doesn't that doesn't seem to bother um race or reza they, they're very happy to talk about the art itself um and and quite quite similar uh, to sarah it's it's really interesting the sort of the roles that we've played in terms of um putting in shape and form to to those conversations um but i do find myself able to balance the two of thinking really expansively but also quite practically when i when i talk to them both that's brilliant. Uh, and then let's let's turn to Hannah. And Hannah, you've had a number of, again, like Jack, you've had a number of different uh, connections and collaborations uh, with with the UK. Um, tell us tell us a little bit about your story of, of working with people in the UK. So, yeah, it started in 2016 when the British Council, in partnership with Unlimited Festival, invited me to attend a seminar discussing about art and disability. And then two months after, I received an email from the BC who offered me to become one of the Indonesian delegation for Unlimited Festival in London. And that opportunity has made me big ambitions to, stay, to step my feet forward. So because I, after I came back from London, I, uh, I got a chance to meet with the Director General of Indonesian Ministry of Education and Culture. Uh, there I told uh, my journey in visiting Unlimited Festival and said that someday we should have our own Arts and Disability Festival. I forgot the details uh, until I was involved in so many discussions, including with the British Council in, in creating Festival Bebas Batas, which was also in collaboration with the government. And finally, it happened in 2018 when you were there as the team, Adam. <laughs> Indeed, remember and it so, fondly. Uh, <laughs> so basically, everything is like a parallel. Until in 28 uh, in 2018, I tried to apply for a grant funded by the British Council, and I was collabing with um, the vacuum cleaner, uh, James Litbitter, Litbitter, aka uh, the vacuum cleaner. I remember clearly I got his name after randomly emailing a list of artists that I got from the UK art <laughs> and disability website. And then mm -hmm. after we got the funding, we decided to create a documentary film that writes about Pasung Phenomenon or Shackled Phenomenon towards people living with mental disabilities in West Java. And the name of the project itself is In Chains. And it became my first international commission to for the British Council to be presented at the festival Bebas, Bebas Batas 
as part of UKID Festival 2018 mm -hmm. and this project took me to different festivals in Germany where I also met many many practitioners from Europe and the UK then it also became a work that was shown at several art festivals in the UK Australia and Indonesia so I could say I've built my professional portfolio significantly at international level since that, which took me to other projects, including my involvement at the Mad Loss Takeover Festival in 2018, where I met a project called Into Us, a, couple, a collaborative project I did with an institution called CGL, located in St. Helens, which becomes the suicide capital of the UK that focused um, on recovery, uh, recovery process for people with alcohol and drugs addiction, where I engaged the clients of the institution to paint and write on top of my character positive things about them, their healing process to their hope of the world. And after that, our collaborative project was exhibited at Mad Love Takeover a month-long festival for mental health where James Litbitter, aka the vacuum cleaner, became one of the curators supported by an organization called, organization called Heart of Glass. There, um, I also connected with many art practitioners, including before I visited uh, St. Helens. I did a project uh, for Mad Love Takeover as part of Art Assembly Festival uh, at a salon in London, where I put cutting stickers uh, of my characters on the window and ask passers by to write something empowering. And I was also yeah. involved in an interview with other disabled artists for a podcast um, produced by Jason. Then there is also an animated film project uh, entitled Celebrating Our Identity, a project that I met with Alexis Maxwell, a POC artist based in St. Helens for the Dadafest International 2019, mm. which explored the shared experience that weigh in our narrative together as mentally disabled artists by using uh, illustration, animation, and sound to explore the barriers in both uh, Indonesia and the UK. So we produce this project ourselves and work on it remotely due to the pandemic. And you know what? I got the information about this grant opportunity from James, where at right. first I was very confused with whom to collaborate. Until yeah. he mentioned Alexis Maxwell, someone who came to the Mad Love Takeover in St. Helens, but I didn't get to meet her in person. And yes, again, help Alexis and I in writing the application. Yeah, it is Emily, the producer of Heart of Glass. Until right. we finally got the funding, it's really a positive power of meeting people. Yeah. So there's a so there's a very palpable sense that you you collaborate with 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 one person and that leads to being being exactly. able to collaborate with others, which is also the sense that 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 we have from Sarah and Jack and Hannah. I I want to ask uh, you. It's obviously been uh been been very enjoyable for you to collaborate with people in the uk and you're you're now a, a, a successful artist in in yeah. indonesia do, do you feel that the collaborations with the uk help you to be a uh, to develop your your work and your practice in indonesia definitely for me art is about connecting with people's emotion it is personal but also can be universal at the same time it is about connecting with other human rights issues in giving voice to people who are voiceless and marginalized. And it is also about creating conversation um, and giving voice to, question that, to questions that need to be answered. And as an artist, I feel must continue to present work that provide joy, interaction, and inspiration, but they also provide wide criticism of the system to encourage the community to engage wisely and um, make uh, steps in social progress. Mm. I want to be a professional artist without hiding my identity as disabled because I'm proud of that. And by working with artists and community in the UK, it, like what you said, Adam, it always leads me to beautiful exchange ideas, which creates a uh, 
artistic growth, empathy, and new understandings. It also gives me the power to unify various narratives. It has opened up my horizon to a very wide level, like how I how how I value myself and others, how I appreciate differences. This is this point is so important until how I work professionally, and I never thought. I could be at this point remembering my past was such a big mess and now I have the power to speak uh, to speak up to and to be who I am uh, because in the past I was always afraid that my identity as a disabled and someone who actively campaign for mental health issues will be considered um, sensitive and would become obstacle for me to enter other artistic ecosystem but i was wrong because slowly i'm able to break those doubts and the other thing i found that really impacted me uh, was the problem solving it helped me to um, also try my adaptability in working with different kind of people because i'm an artist independent artist who will hopefully one day work as multidisciplinary artist and I think this kind of practice is so important to me and I also have learned so much from the, this journey to be more professional as an artist without hiding my identity again and forgetting the value of uh, collectivity and then togetherness and understanding how we as figures who have power can empower others to stand together and listen to what we really need to get our rights and art is proven to be one of the best way to achieve that and one last thing please <laughs> another benefit of working uh, with uh, professional organizations or artists in the uk is that they help me a lot to pave my way in the art world with mm. a structure program and then professional human resources and their network, they really helped me to present my ideas and work better and have more values. Fantastic. Well, that's that's terrific to hear. And I, I'm very interested then to, to, to come back to both Sarah and Jack to get a sense of what, what struck you particularly about working in Indonesia and working with uh, Indonesian creative partners. Did you did you find that you adapted your own working practice? Were there things that you learned from working with Indonesia? Who wants to go first? Sarah. Uh, I, I, thanks again, Hannah, for such an mm. eloquent story about your work, working practice. I think some things struck me as Hannah was talking, and that was about valuing people. And it that's very much, I would hope, the bedrock of Coralie's practice, valuing the people that we're working with. It was really um, exciting to collaborate with an Indonesian organization or uh, group who also share that uh, understanding. Rooted at the, at the base of the project was valuing everybody that was going to take part. It was learning from each other nuances uh, of how we value people and growing that by collaborating. So I also wrote down live, something very beautiful about how live the collaboration was um, because it was two very different, not very different, two different ways of working coming together through the practice. It felt very live learning, if that makes sense. Uh, and that was very exciting. It was also fun, and I think that really important that we we didn't know what was going to unfold when we came up with the idea of the digital dance toolkit. And in some respects, it sounds really dry, but it was so much it was so much fun to collaborate with Gigi Art of Dance in terms of how their uh, dancers responded to the ideas, but also unexpected funny things happened. So, for example one of the toolkits uses a spaghetti spoon as a prompt and uh, 
it's just an idea find an object in your house and mm -hmm. dj used a spaghetti spoon and then all the young dancers from giggy art of dance created dances with spaghetti spoons <laughs> and, so, and suddenly we had a spaghetti spoon dance off which hadn't been planned at all but something about the beauty of valuing everybody's creative input and how yeah. live the collaboration can be because of that that's fantastic um uh, Jack, were, were there things that you think you've uh, you, you've you've learnt, uh, or how you've adapted working practice in in collaborating with Indonesian partners, or working in Indonesia? Yeah, I mean, I think that Rice and Reza kind of sensed. I mean, they because they were creating some really important parts of the tapestry of our new play. You know, a site visit to Bidu, which is a a rural village in Indonesia, and they were the first artists on the planet to see this cave system. Mm. They, they could sense that, um, as we were discussing it, that I was willing to risk, uh, you know, the creative, um, I guess the creative output of almost the entire play on, on whatever it was that they found and recorded. Mm. And that was a real, you know, this kind of baton passing thing, that was a real kind of offer. Um, and that really just came from just knowing that knowing that the way they see the world and 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 the questions that they were asking of me it just sort of completely maybe unlike kind of bilateral um creative relationships in theater in this country it just felt kind of very natural that what they would find would be the right thing mm. um and that's um that's particularly the case with a, a, a play and a production that's looking at the origins of human creativity it was really apt, you know, like, and it was also super apt that I was, you know, as a white male in my mid thirties, I was, I was not the one going to this vid village with a camera and recordings, you know, it's, it was really apt on many, many levels. Um, and, and what happened as a result of that was they had to put a lot of trust in me to kind of work with what they'd found to put that into the tapestry of our our artists here in the UK. So, yeah, I don't know how you could sum that up in one word. I guess just sort of, that's the, be that's the real beauty of this type of devised and collaborative theatre. And it just goes to show that everyone, you know, whoever is in the room is the right person. Um, and I would say there's probably a practice in there somewhere, but, but mostly it's, um, mostly it's that kind of openness and trust and, and, uh, yeah and no one no one else, no one is really putting kind of their subjectivity on your collaboration that's my big advice that, yeah like if you're able to be free of worrying what other people will think then often from there comes like deeply kind of thoughtful and moving and personal collaboration Yeah. Are there are there other approaches um, I mean, to, to any of you, actually, are there are there approaches that you think are important for sustaining relationships at this distance? I mean, obviously, it's a it's a very long way. And I mean, Hannah, you, you you've obviously developed relationships with people in the UK that have been sustained over over now several years. How, how do you how do you keep those relationships uh, going and how do you how do you manage to to continue to have a, a kind of warm collaborative relationship with people over that over that distance and over that length of time? Okay, so far I still keep in touch with colleagues who have collaborated directly or who were only involved in the same event, mm. and we still have pretty good friendship either through social media or email and WhatsApp. We send messages to each other regarding current situation, current condition, to projects we are currently working on, or even share funding links for international uh, projects. I think this uh, one is the most important piece in fostering sustainable relations between countries, uh, because I think with this kind of uh, communication, we often discuss about what can we do to meet again, to be, able, to be able to drink beer and create something together. And this is also based on my recent experience, Adam, where I tried to contact many organizations in the UK for a grant opportunity from the British Council. Uh, <laughs> and a few days before the deadline, and a few days before the deadline, I just got a replay from a learning disability uh, organization based in Manchester. And there was a misunderstanding where it turned out that we didn't rush to finish the application because the deadline was closed. 
even though our communication and enthusiasm <laughs> had gone quite well until a few days after they emailed me again to discuss about the potential for other smaller scale collaborative project in the future. So basically, again, this kind of communication as an approach is very important for me to continue to be able to create collaboration opportunities both on a large or small scale, maybe in the f- near future. Yeah. yeah. Sarah, you've, you've, you've obviously uh, developed the relationship more during lockdown, as, we, as we've discussed. Uh, how, are you, how are you planning to evolve that relationship in, in future? Yeah, I was just thinking again as Hannah was chatting. I was thinking about uh, what had made what made the collaboration successful during lockdown, and I think it's just also hearing Jack talk. It was very much not having a predetermined outcome. I think mm. the fact that we had the digital dance toolkit was open ended anyway. Please, you take it and respond in the way that you want. But we didn't know. We, we sort of thought, oh, well, they'll do this and they'll do that. But it it really did open up what the potential of that toolkit so it's really exciting to just uh, at, at the base of the collaboration is not having a predetermined outcome having an understanding of a shared project and shared ambition and shared goals but not saying we want it to be like that and just reflecting on what Jack's saying that is quite unusual to have that to, to really live that I think maybe in the, in the UK, we're, we're used to saying, oh, this is a collaboration and a partnership. We don't know where it's going, but we sort of do. So yeah. I think it was great to be very, very honest about that. And in terms of what we want to do next and how to keep the relationship going, yes, absolutely, social media uh, and, and keeping in touch. There's something very much about the energy of Giggy's Young Dancers that for this collaboration was perfectly right with uh, sharing the expertise of our adult company, but we really want to do something with bringing our youth company together together with the young dancers of Giggy because the the energy is going to be something quite wild. That's, that sounds fantastic. We'll really look forward to seeing that. And um, and and Jack, finally, where where is your uh, uh, collaboration going in the future? Um, I should say that I I saw the play deciphering uh, uh, a couple of months ago and it's uh, it's absolutely terrific piece of work and the Indonesian representation in it is is uh, was quite emotional for me uh, uh, missing that country greatly but Jack where is the where is the relationship going well Rice messaged me at 7 a.m uh, saying that <laughs> my profile picture makes me look uh, stupid so <laughs> That sounds like a very warm and loving relationship. Just great feedback there from Rice. <laughs> what a guy. What a guy. Um, well, the thing, the thing about Rice and, and also what we do at Curious Directive, we have um, in Norwich, uh, we don't have, interestingly, we don't have a very developed theatre sector here in Norwich and um, in Makassar. Um, there are similar kind of questions, and but we both run co-working spaces for artists. So we're talking mm. a lot about that at the moment, about what do we need to do to, from... Yeah, from the kind of very um, grassroots level, what do we need to do to create kind of safe and collaborative spaces for freelance artists as well as groups of artists? Um, and I'm really like, I'm always impressed with Rice's, when we talk, it's a really varied mix, right? Like it's silly stuff, but also last, like last night, he just sent me the screenshot of all the places he plans to visit to do projects like this Excel document from a very relaxed <laughs> guy. And I was like, that's incredible. And he's just got this, he sent it to me, this huge list of sort of ideas that in, are in his his brain. And um, and I'm sure maybe one of them I'll, I'll go along. Um, I'm Hopefully. not good in the heat though, so. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, Indonesia is quite warm most of the year, but, uh, but if you go up high enough in the mountains, you'll be fine. Um, so uh, that's that's all we've got time for, sadly. Uh, thank you so much to Sarah and to Jack and to Hannah for sharing your perspectives and your stories. Um, it, we're we're all going to hopefully be able to uh, to, to hang out um, uh, at this at this uh, conference uh, over the next uh, uh, for the rest of today and hopefully over the next couple of days. Uh, but for now, I'm going to hand back to Camelia Harahat from the British Council. Thank you. Thank you so much, Adam, Hannah, Sarah, Jack, uh, for the really insightful conversation. It's always really, really exciting to hear from artists themselves about the experiences working collaboratively and what actually similarities you can find 
between uh, UK and Indonesia working together. And I hope that conversation was helpful to shed a light into what's possible when working internationally between UK and Indonesia. And even the segment before that, that can help build a context about the market and insights into the arts and cultural sector here. So after a whirlwind one and a half hours tour across Indonesia and Nongkrong together with us, I'd just like to point out some maybe helpful suggestions in case the audiences are keen on pursuing further connections between UK and Indonesia. Uh, so if we can bring up the slide. Um, we have set up some, uh, we have set up an Indonesia country pavilion, uh, which is available on the platform that you can visit to watch some of our videos to see some examples of UK and Indonesia projects. You could also download various reports and research that we have conducted in the past few years including the cultural cities profiles and the festivals research, which was discussed earlier today. And if there's something that you could not yet find, um, you can contact our team directly through the booth um, and we can follow up with you and providing some more information or insights into other reports. And if there is any other questions, feel free to just click on the register your interests uh, button, which is on the country pavilion or leave a message on the public chat in our booth and definitely our team will um, get back to you and uh, try to reply to you as soon as possible. And of course, you're all also invited to the facilitated networking event on Thursday. So feel free to use the networking function on the platform to meet new people, but we'll have a facilitated event um, on the last day of the, the, the series. So you can also visit the Southeast Asia and Opportunities booth to learn more about our programs, download our other reports, and find out about uh, current live opportunities for collaborations. And lastly, we hope that you join as many sessions as you can over the remaining days. Uh, following a brief 15-minute break after this, we will invite you to head on to one of our post-session networking huddles so you, we can kind of continue the conversation after this. But after that, in 15 minutes, we'll have the Malaysia Country Briefing session called Malaysia Now, Arts and Culture Mosaic, and then a thematic session on climate change titled, What Does It Mean for Arts and Cultural Rights? Then tomorrow, which is day three, we'll start with the Vietnam Country Briefing session called the Vietnam Connections, and then followed by the Thailand Country Briefing called Thailand Arts for Change. And then lastly, we'll end with a thematic session called Arts for All, which is examining the arts and inclusion agenda in the Southeast Asia region. And finally, on day four, we have two sessions. The first again, starting at 9 a.m. UK time is the Philippines Country Briefing session called Entry Points Between the Philippines and UK. And then they will be followed by our last session of the event, which is the facilitated and interactive networking session called Connections That Count. So I hope you all managed to participate and attend these sessions as well as browsing through the country booths for more resources. And thank you once again for joining the Indonesia Beyond the Art of Nongkrong session. We hope to see you in our next session. Um, and yeah, hope you hope you guys enjoyed the session and we'll see you again next time. Thank you, everyone.